Today, we're looking at the key details of the three public pension plans that we have available to us in Canada. Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security, and Guaranteed Income Supplement. And yes, combined, these can add up to a lot of money for you. My name is Reese. I'm a financial advisor, and I find that this is one of the biggest areas of confusion for Canadians when it comes to building out their retirement plans. A lot of people have absolutely no idea how these work or how that impacts them until they actually end up receiving them. So what I want to do is help you get your head around the key details of these different pension plans so that you can make really good decisions in advance of actually getting them. And that alone can pay huge dividends. But one important note before we dive in is that the numbers that we're using today are all based on right now and it is mid-April 2023. But you need to keep in mind that these numbers are constantly adjusted for inflation so they will be changing. But the numbers aren't the most important thing anyway. Understanding the basic concepts of how these programs work is and I'm going to make it very easy for you. So let's do it. CPP, Canada Pension Plan. This plan is actually a gem, and I really do mean that. Our CPP is the envy of a lot of countries around the world. As of last reporting, this plan has $536 billion in it. It has had an average rate of return of 10% a year, and it is set to have all its obligations met for the next 75 years. This plan is a tank. And part of the reason that it's so strong is that it's not actually managed by our government. It's managed by the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, and they are a totally separate entity. And so far, they've been doing a very good job. But it is also strong because we put a lot of money into the plan. It is really well funded. And here's how that works. If you work in Canada, you have to contribute to the plan, mandatory. And your employer will just take your contributions right off of your checks. So even if you don't realize that you're contributing, you are. And your employer is matching whatever you put in, unless you're self-employed. And if you are self-employed, then you actually have to put in both chunks. But there are limits. In 2023, we put in 5.95% of whatever we make, as does the employer on our behalf. But we don't contribute anything on the first three 3,500 we earn and it caps out at 66,600, which is referred to as the yearly maximum pensionable earnings or YMPE if you want to get geeky about it. So if we do make more than that, then we don't have to contribute to CPP on any of the amount that we make above that number. And if you do make more than that, then you might notice that in October or November or whenever it is that your income crosses that upper threshold, you actually start getting larger paychecks. And that's because you aren't contributing to CPP anymore you've already capped out and then of course in january the clock starts all over again and you have to start contributing again you see the idea here is that originally cpp was meant to provide us with 25 percent of our pre-retirement income during retirement and that has since been enhanced to get us up to 33 percent but again up to that limit. So that's how they came up with all of these numbers and that's why you pay what you pay. Now the fun part, how much money do you get? That is a tricky question. It depends mainly on three things. First of all, how much did you put into the plan? How long did you put in? And when do you start taking from the plan? We already talked about what you put in because that's just based on how much you've earned over the years. But how long is totally dependent on how many years you've worked in Canada between the ages of 18 and 65. Basically, the more that you put into the plan, the more that you're going to get out of the plan. And in order to get the maximum amount possible out of CPP, you would have had to have maxed out your contributions for 39 years along the way. And as of now, that would get you $1,306 a month. But obviously, for a whole bunch of different reasons, not everybody maxes out their contributions. Some people earn less. Some people move to Canada later in life. Some people take a few years off during the course of their working life. Some people go to school for an extended period of time, etc. In fact, the average CPP benefit in 2023 is $811 a month. And I did the math on that, and it equals 62% of the full benefit, which is quite a bit less. The last major impact on how much you're going to get is when you decide to start taking it. 65 is the normal age. That is when you're eligible for the full 
non-reduced amount of whatever you were set to get. But you can take it as early as age 60 or as late as age 70 with implications either way. For every month you want to take it early, you will lose 0.6% for the rest of your life. So if you take it at age 64, you will have a permanent decrease of 7.2% of your benefit for the rest of your life. If you take it at age 60, then that adds up to a reduction permanently of 36%. Now let's put some skin on those numbers. Let's say your benefit at age 65 is set to be $1,000 a month. If you start at age 60, then your benefit would drop 36% to $640 per month. That is a big haircut. On the flip side, if you delay taking your pension past the age of 65, you will get a 0.7% increase for every month that you delay it for the rest of your life. So if you take it at age 66, you would add 8.4% to your benefit for the rest of your life. If you hold off all the way until 70, then you'd end up with an increase of 42% for the rest of your life. And again, using that $1,000 per month example, delaying to age 70 would take your benefit to 1,420 per month. That is a huge difference. And we haven't even factored in the little cost of living adjustments and increases that you would get along the way. But it is true. There are legitimate reasons why you would not want to delay taking your CPP. Maybe you need the funds, or maybe you have a shortened life expectancy, or maybe you have plans to reinvest it and you feel like you could do better with the investment choices that you have available to you. And that's fair. Everybody has a totally different situation. But I will say this, I've been doing this for a really long time now and I know the research and I know the math and we have really expensive and sophisticated software and we're able to get down there at a granular level and we're able to tweak it month by month and we can see exactly what the impact will be for each one of our clients and the reality is the numbers are what the numbers are they just don't lie if you think you're going to live past age 82 then financially speaking, it is almost always in your benefit to delay taking CPP. Another beautiful perk of CPP is that it's actually indexed to grow with inflation. So as long as there's inflation, every year your benefit will grow a bit. And in a world where pension plans are pretty much going the way of the dodo bird, it really is nice to have a decent chunk of your income guaranteed and indexed to grow for the rest of your life. Now, while all of those details are helpful, they don't actually tell you what you will get. And unfortunately, no one can, not even Service Canada, but they can give you an estimate. So once you have an account set up with them, and it can be a bit of a tedious process getting there, but once you do, you can log in and you can find out what your estimates are gonna be for age 60, age 65, and age 70. Again, these are just estimates and they're based on what you put into the plan so far. So the closer you are to age 65, the more accurate these numbers are gonna be for you. Now briefly, there are just a few more features of CPP that I wanna mention that can affect the amount that you're gonna get. For instance, there is a child rearing provision that allows you to drop out up to seven years of lower income from the formula if you are taking care of a child or children. This can actually give you a pretty decent little boost but you have to apply for it, it's not automatic. The other is the post-retirement benefit, and this is applicable for anyone age 60 to 70 who is taking CPP but chooses to keep working. Basically, you have to keep paying into CPP if you're still working, but you only have to do that up to age 65. After that, it's totally up to you. But any of these additional contributions that you do make during that period will give you an incremental bump in the benefit that you get, so that's a win. To wrap up this CPP section, I'm just going to mention a few more features that you can look into deeper on your own if you want to. If you pass away and you have a spouse, there is a survivor benefit that can be paid to your spouse. If you pass away or become disabled, there's a benefit for your children, if you have any. There's also a disability benefit if that should happen to you. And there's even a lump sum death benefit of up to $2,500. Lastly, you do have to apply for CPP. It is not automatic, and that's because there's just such a range of when you can take it. So you just have to let them know when you want to start. And I almost forgot. Yes, CPP benefits are taxable. Lame, but true. Now, on to OAS. This one is quite a bit more simple. Kinda. 
This one has absolutely nothing to do with how much you put into a plan, has nothing to do with your income, has nothing to do with your assets. It is purely based off of how long you've lived in Canada and when you want to start taking it. But as long as you have lived in Canada for 40 years after the age of 18, then you are eligible for the full amount. It's that simple. And the max amount now, and these are April to June 2023 numbers, is $691 a month at age 65. That is full pop. If you haven't lived in Canada the full 40 years, you can calculate your benefit pretty easily by just tallying up the number of years that you've lived in Canada after the age of 18 and then dividing that by 40. So for example, if you've lived here for 20 years, then you just divide 20 by 40 and you'll see that you will get 0.5 or 50% of the full benefit. And that is $345 per month based on current rates. 10 years would be 10 divided by 40, which would equal 25% of the benefit or $172 a month. Now, in addition to the regular amount, you also get a 10% automatic bump when you hit age 75. So right now, that would be $760 a month if you were getting the max amount. Add that to your CPP and that can actually be a pretty decent base income. Now, like CPP, OAS is unfortunately taxable. But also like CPP, it's indexed to grow with inflation or the cost of living. The consumer price index is technically what they use, but they don't do it annually. With OAS, it's done quarterly. So you can actually get four little raises along the year if there's inflation. If there is no inflation, there's actually deflation and the cost of living goes down, your old age security benefit will never actually go down. There is a floor. It can actually only stay the same or go up. But unlike CPP, there is no pot of money. Old age security payments are funded entirely by government revenues, taxes. And since this is one of the biggest expenses that our government has, coupled with the fact that we actually have an aging population, this is actually somewhat concerning, but I have a whole nother video on that, so I won't dive into it here, but I will post a link below and one at the end of the video if you do wanna learn more about that. As for OAS eligibility, that depends on where you live. If you're living in Canada, you have to be a Canadian citizen or a legal resident when your application is approved. And you have to have lived in Canada for at least 10 years after the age of 18. If you're living in another country, Yes, you can actually still collect old age security, but you have to have been a citizen or a legal resident the day before you left Canada, and you have to have lived in Canada for at least 20 years since the age of 18. Now, there are some nuances there, especially if you live or lived in a country that has a social security agreement with Canada, but that's getting a bit deep for this video. But I will post a link to a great article from Doug Runchy on that exact topic below, and he is a bit of a Jedi in this space. Now, like CPP, you do have options as to when you can take your OAS, but just not as many. In fact, you cannot start it early. 65 is the normal age and that's the earliest that you can start it. And actually, if everything is running smoothly, your payments are just gonna automatically start the month after you turn 65. So if you do plan to delay it, you definitely need to let them know in advance. And in terms of delaying it, it's just like CPP. You can delay all the way up until age 70. And yes, you get an increased benefit for every month that you delay it for the rest of your life, also like CPP. The difference is you only get 0.6% a month for each month that you delay, unlike CPP, which remember was 0.7% per month. So if you're choosing to just delay one of them, if you wanna take one of them to help support your income, you're definitely gonna to wanna to look at delaying CPP because there's just way more bang for buck there. And if you're gonna hold off all the way until age 70, the difference is 42% increase with CPP versus 36% with OAS. So it is a big difference. And just so you know the numbers, if you did wanna delay your old age security from 65 all the way to 70, then your benefit would jump from 691 a month to 939 a month. But again, that's not even including all of the little inflation indexing that you would get along the way. Anyway, just like CPP, there are valid reasons for taking it at 65, but there's also valid reasons for delaying it. But with OAS, there's one extra curveball: the dreaded clawback. Basically, if you make over a certain amount, you will start to lose a part of the benefit. And if your income is big enough, then eventually you'll lose all of it. For 2023, 
clawback begins once your net income is 86,192 in the year and your benefit is fully lost once your income hits 142,124. But of course, the numbers are always changing and adjusting with inflation, so it's the concept that we really wanna focus on here. And the way that it works is that you have to pay back 15% of however much your income surpasses that first threshold. So if your income was 10,000 over the current 86,192 clawback base, then you would have to pay back 15% of that $10,000, which would be $1,500. If this does happen to you, you don't actually have to cut the government a check to pay them back. The amount you owe will simply be divided up monthly and reduced from your payments that you would get in the next year. And yes, they will notify you of this, or at least they say they will. Now, statistically, not that many Canadians actually run into this and very few Canadians end up losing the full benefit entirely but it is a thing to pay attention to because it can sneak up on you. See, the clawback is based on your global taxable income, all of it. So this includes pensions, RIF payments, rental income, interest, dividends, and yes, capital gains, which can easily catch you off guard if you sell some non-registered investments or maybe a secondary property. And sometimes there's just nothing that you can do about it. But other times with a little bit of planning and a little bit of forethought, there's quite a bit that you can do to just either simply avoid it or at least minimize the amount that you lose. Taking a blend of RIF and TFSA income is actually a pretty good strategy for being able to control your income. All you have to do on an annual basis is look at where you're at and play with the numbers you can shift either one up or down to get you into that sweet spot or if you're expecting a big capital gain in a year then you may just want to lean more into your tfsa for your income since all of that income is tax-free also if you have a higher retirement income than your spouse then you can split certain pension income or share your cpp benefits in order to bring down your taxable income that's just a smart move in general, but it can definitely help as well with fending off the old clawback. The last thing I'll say about the clawback is that if you're still working between ages 65 and 70 and your income is gonna be high enough where you're gonna have a certain amount of your old age security clawed back or even all of it, then you definitely wanna consider delaying your old age security until your income is not so high, considering that you're just gonna lose a bunch of it anyway. I know that sounds obvious as I'm saying it, but a lot of people just don't even think about it. And and since your old age security payments start automatically, if you don't tell them otherwise, a lot of people just start getting that income and it just slips through the cracks. If this happens to you, don't worry. You can have your payments stopped within the first six months. However, you do have to pay back all of that within the next six months, but that obviously is fair. And finally, the last one, guaranteed income supplement. GIS is definitely designed for those with a fairly low income. And so you may get some of this benefit at some point for some period of time, but then again, some people simply never do. Many people never do. To get this one, you must be receiving OAS and living in Canada, and it is based on income. The numbers for April to June 2023 are as follows, and I am just going to rifle through this because they have got very detailed and up-to-date numbers that are very easy to see and read through on the CRA website. If you are single, widowed, or divorced, then your income has to be below 20952 And if it is, then the max you could get from GIS would be $1,032 a month. But if you have a spouse, it's a bit more complicated. If your spouse is getting full OAS, then your family income has to be below 27,648 to collect up to a maximum of 621 a month. If your spouse is collecting the allowance, which I'll talk about in a sec, then your family income needs to be below 38,736 to collect up to a maximum of 621. Lastly, if your spouse doesn't get either OAS or the allowance, then your family income needs to be below 50,208 in order to receive up to a maximum of $1,032. But keep in mind, those are maximum benefit amounts. The more that you earn within those thresholds, the more your benefit will be reduced. You need to be earning very little in order to be able to collect full GIS. But 
whatever you do earn is not taxable, unlike CPP and OAS. So that's nice. Now, another part of the GIS program is the allowance, which I just referenced a moment ago. To get this one, you have to be age 60 to 64, and you have to have a spouse who is eligible to receive GIS. And as of current numbers, your combined income has to be below 38,736. If all the above applies, then the maximum monthly benefit you could get here is 1,312. Lastly, there is also a survivor allowance and the rules are very similar to the regular allowance, but this one is based entirely on your income, which needs to be below 28,224. And the max amount you could receive for this one, if your income is below that, is 1,564 a month. Okay, we did it. Good for you. Way to stick it through because this stuff is actually very important and it does absolutely affect you. And while these benefits are great and they are, they're simply not going to be enough for most people. But the fact is, is they were never meant to be. They were just meant to provide a solid base. So proper planning in advance of retirement is a very good idea. We do a lot of retirement projections, and I can tell you with confidence that the more you know in advance, the more you look at the implications of decisions such as when to take CPP or which accounts to draw down first or when you should downsize a house, all of those kinds of things can have a dramatic impact on the amount of money that you will have for the rest of your life all the way through retirement. It is a big deal. But I digress. If you found this helpful, even weirdly enjoyable, then subscribe. We'd love to have you. Also, if you happen to have any financial planning issues or concerns that you'd like to see a video on, let us know in the comments below and we'll see what we can do about it. In closing, you may want to check out a couple other videos from some other Canadians that monkey around in this space as well. The Brandon Beavis Investing Channel has a video on this same exact topic, but they go into deeper detail on a few of the topics like CPP disability. And also my friend Adam over at Parallel Wealth has a very good deep dive video on GIS. It's way more detailed than what I did here. I'll post the links to both of those videos below. Cheers.